Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. After almost 10 years in duration, the U.S. war in Afghanistan is the longest war in our country's history, surpassing even the Vietnam War. It is now costing U.S. taxpayers over $100 billion per year, uh, more than the projected annual cost of the new U.S. health care program. And there is the incalculable price tag of thousands of American and allied personnel killed or gravely wounded. So the investment and sacrifice by America in this war in Afghanistan is enormous and has sparked profound debate. President Obama has increased America's investment while referring to, quote, fragile but reversible, unquote, progress in the war. The president has been accused of moving the goalposts and waging a, quote, war of Obama's choosing, unquote, and repeating mistakes of Vietnam. In short, while there's unanimous support for our troops, there's a storm of controversy about whether, how, and how long we should remain in Afghanistan. Today's speaker, Matthew P. Ho, has been in the eye of this storm. Mr. Ho is a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. He's also the director of the Afghanistan Study Group, a network of foreign and public policy experts focused on Afghanistan. Prior to his current position, Mr. Ho spent two tours of duty in Iraq, including as Marine Corps company commander. When not deployed, Mr. Ho worked on Afghanistan and Iraq policy and operations issues at the Pentagon and State Department from 2002 through 2008. In 2009, he was appointed the senior civilian representative for the U.S. government in Afghanistan. In September of that same year, Mr. Ho resigned his post to protest the strategic policies of the United States in Afghanistan. In so doing, he became the highest ranking U.S. government official to renounce our foreign policy in Afghanistan. In 2010, Mr. Ho received the Ridenauer Prize for truth-telling, and his writings have appeared in numerous national publications. Please welcome to the City Club, Matthew P. Ho. Thank you, Hugh. It's uh, very nice to be here today. Uh, this is my first time to Cleveland. I want to thank uh, Hugh McKay and Jim Foster for uh, hosting me, as well as uh, Mary Hagley and the uh, Peace Alliance of Champaign uh, for getting me out here and organizing this. It also should be noted that Mary's son is a soldier serving in Afghanistan right now. Um, this is my first time uh, to Cleveland. I have a lot of uh, uh, family that are Ohio uh, folks, though, uh, particularly down in the Columbus area. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time around Indians and Browns fans. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Mets and Giants guy, but uh, I understand what you've gone through uh, for most of your lives. I've seen it, you know, closely. I also understand how sincere you are uh, uh, in your love for those teams. But, um, no, it is nice to be here. Uh, uh, I, I am a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Uh, I also run a project called the Afghanistan Study Group Project. Uh, as Hugh said, uh, that's a, a, a network of foreign policy uh, 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 professionals and intellectuals and academics, uh, former government folks, former military, who first got together uh, in November of 2009 uh, to discuss alternatives to where we thought uh, the country was going to go with Afghanistan, alternatives to escalating uh, the Afghan war. Uh, we met several times in 2009, 2010, and then last year, last August, we published our report uh, with our assessment of the war in Afghanistan, along with our recommendations. Uh, and you can find that report on our website. Uh, we maintain a website with a blog. We actually have one of our fellows in Kabul right now blogging uh, uh, fairly constantly about what he sees on the streets there in Kabul. Um, and you can find this report on our website and our blog at afghanistanstudygroup.org. Um, excuse me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about where we are now in Afghanistan. Um, and what I see as what's going to continue to happen in Afghanistan and what are alternatives to uh, what we currently uh, are going through in Afghanistan in terms of policy. Uh, most folks, unfortunately, I think, throughout the country, and particularly in Washington, D.C., do not feel a need to discuss the Afghan war. Uh, after June uh, 2011, uh, end of June, uh, when President Obama said we're going to begin bringing home troops from Afghanistan will bring 33,000 over the next 14 months 
back from Afghanistan. I think most people thought that that's the end of the war, that no need to discuss it any longer because the war is de-escalating and that 2014 is going to be here and the war will be done. So no need to talk about it. And that certainly is the climate in Washington, D.C. Uh, and there certainly are other issues that must be discussed. Uh, we have terrible unemployment in this country. Uh, we have a, a housing market that uh, has not recovered from, from one of the worst uh, 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 boom and bust cycles ever. We have a, a horde of other issues. I mean, we just had an earthquake in Washington, D.C. I mean, so there's all kinds of things to talk about other than uh, the Afghan war because in a lot of people's minds, the war is ending. And unfortunately, if we keep with the current policy that we have right now, if we keep with the actual current strategy of how we actually work in Afghanistan, what we're actually doing in Afghanistan, how we're taking sides in a, in a multi-sided, multi-layered uh, civil war, what we're going to see is that 2014 is going to show up, and we're going to be in the same conflict, the same war that we are in right, right now. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a time machine, right? Um, we would do a lot of things differently if we did. Uh, I'm assuming the president would probably get in a time machine and go back to 2009 and make a decision differently on the Afghan war. Rather than escalate it, he would find a way to de-escalate it and disentangle himself from the war. Because what we've seen, how I like to describe it, is in 2009, when the president was making this decision on what to do with the Afghan war, whether to uh, disengage and de-escalate or to escalate it, uh, we were about waist deep in quicksand. Okay? With the escalation of the war, with the addition of 70,000 more foreign troops to the conflict, and literally tens upon tens of billions of dollars more. And one of the things to note is that the foreign money in that is being spent in that country, the waves upon waves of billions of dollars in the third poorest country in the world is having just as much a damaging effect, is causing as much of an escalation uh, of the conflict as the presence of foreign troops or any other factor. Um, but I think what you've seen is that at 2009, we were waist deep in quicksand. And now we find ourselves chest deep okay, in quicksand. Uh, one of the problems is that over the last couple of years, there hasn't been valid alternatives. There hasn't been uh, uh, valid opposing voices. Uh, the president, if anyone has not read Bob Woodward's book, Obama's Wars, uh, I recommend you do so. It gives a first, you know, uh, uh, through Woodward's eyes, but also many accounts from primary sources of the decision-making process in escalating the war. And you see that the president was never really given any other options other than you can escalate the war small, medium, or large, Mr. President. Okay, so that's one of the problems is we haven't, he wasn't given any other choices, no alternatives. And so now we find ourselves in a position where the war is by any measure larger, by any standard worse, uh, and it has grown from being an insurgency and a conflict that a couple of years ago was mostly confined to the south and the east of the country to a conflict that now has spread throughout the country and that you find uh, 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 moving uh, and growing uh, in the northwest and the urban areas as well. Among folks who a couple of years ago wouldn't have been part of the insurgency. So what you've seen over the last couple of years is a weakening of the Car Karzai government a weakening of the political process, a growth of the violence, and increased support for the insurgency uh, throughout the country. But I want to get back to my organization real quick, uh, the Afghanistan Study Group. Um, we generally agree, and in our report we say we agree, with the President's goals in, for the United States in that part of the world. Uh, the two goals for the United States are the uh, destruction, defeat, deterrence, etc of Al-Qaeda and affiliated uh, terror groups, and the stability of Pakistan uh, because of its nuclear weapons. Um, by any measures, we see that uh, the current policy in Afghanistan either does not address the threat from Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda is simply not there, and that's something we'll get into a little later, or has a counterproductive nature by making things in Pakistan much worse. I, I don't think there's anybody in this room or anyone listening who would say Pakistan is in a better place now in 2011 than it was in 2009 or in 2005 or in 2001. So what we see is a policy that is ineffectual against a real threat, al-Qaeda and affiliated terrorist groups, and counterproductive in terms of achieving our goals of regional stability, particularly with regards to our concern for the safeguarding of, Pakistanis, of, the, of Pakistan's uh, nuclear weapons. So 
we basically uh, have recommendations uh, that we put out. Uh, there's five recommendations. I won't go into detail here uh, on them, but the primary thing is, is political reconciliation. Uh, understand that what is occurring in Afghanistan is a war that goes on, uh, uh, has been going on since the mid-70s, uh, that's multi-sided, multi-layered, and that needs to be political efforts at local, national, and then also on the regional level uh, amongst Afghanistan and its neighbors in order to bring about any type of stability. We also recognize that the fight against Al-Qaeda is not taking place in Afghanistan. Uh, Al-Qaeda is an organization that is uh, composed of individuals in small cells around the world. Uh, it numbers at the high end, the estimates are 4,000. Uh, I think that's probably generous. It's probably closer to 2,000 maybe uh, worldwide in a Muslim population of 1.6 billion. Um, and if you look at the nature of their attacks, again, and the way they operate, again, through individuals and small cells that are connected by an ideology, that are connected through the Internet. Okay? Al-Qaeda is an organization that, that works and floats like an ideological cloud. Okay? So having troops in Afghanistan or having troops anywhere in the world is not going to affect an organization that is more like a criminal syndicate okay, than it is uh, any type of organization that you'll defeat with brigade combat teams or B-1 bombers okay, or Tomahawk cruise missiles. Okay? It's an organization that needs to be addressed through intelligence and law enforcement means as opposed to occupying foreign terrain. So where are we at now in Afghanistan? Uh, if you look at three separate areas, if you look at the military situation, the political situation, and the economic situation, you see that it has gotten worse. Militarily, at best, we can say we're in a stalemate. And I think that'll be the case for years to come. Even if we put more resources into the conflict, we will be in a draw uh, or in a stalemate for years to come. Um, if you look at any standards for the violence, any, any, any of the metrics out there, um, it's just as violent for American forces as it was in 2010. Uh, over 300 Americans have been killed this year. Uh, well over 3,000 have been wounded. Uh, that's one of the things that folks I don't think recognize about or realize about the war is that um, we have a ratio of close to 10 to 1 in terms to, of wounded to killed. In previous conflicts, it was 3 to 1. So that kind of hides uh, the severity uh, of the fighting that's occurring right there. Uh, it's the deadliest war so far uh, uh, for civilians. I mean, deadliest year of the war for civilians. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll see 2011 be a record for civilian casualties. Uh, just as 2010 was, just as 2009 was, uh, et cetera. Uh, we also see that the insurgencies, uh, financial, logistics, and operational chains have not been broken. Despite the reports coming out of our headquarters in Kabul or coming from the Pentagon that we have broken the momentum of the Taliban, you do not see that in actuality. Okay? You see their operations are just as intense, their tempo is just as high as any year previous. In June of this year, our Department of Defense reported that there were 1,600 IEDs, or improvised explosive devices, roadside, or roadside bombs, or, or small bombs that are put to hit our troops when, when they're walking, 1,600 in the month of June. Okay, that comes out to 53 a day. That's a record for this war. All right, so 53 times a day, the enemy is putting bombs into the ground trying to kill our troops that we know of. How many did we not find? How many is it because like an Afghan bus hits it and, and goes up in, in, in flames and we don't know about that? Okay, but 53 times a day, they're able to put bombs into the side of the road. If you're able to do that, that means your financing is intact, your logistics is intact, your support, your support among the population is intact, okay, and certainly your operations are intact. So we see that this military surge has not had an effect on the enemy. And in fact, the enemy has basically, and when I say the enemy or I say the insurgency, you're talking about a group that's not monolithic, a, a, a group that's composed of many, many multiple groups within Afghanistan that have, many of them have, legitimate political grievances. There are some that are hardcore ideologues, okay? There are some that will never be able to be reconciled. But the vast majority of the insurgency, just like we found in Iraq, is composed of these groups that have local political grievances that can be and should be addressed. But what the insurgency has done is they've mounted an assassination campaign. Okay, so when we target the insurgency, we do all these kill and capture missions. Okay, we said, we, everyone's heard about night raids, and we, we send uh, uh, some of our special forces, mill and night, kick indoors. We do this about a dozen times a day. And that, the idea is that you're going to break down the insurgency leadership, 
as well as take away uh, uh, the willingness of people to, enjoy the, to join insurgency. Well, we haven't seen that effect because insurgency is even bigger than it was before. What the insurgency has done on its side, though, is they've recognized that, and now we're going to talk about the political situation in Afghanistan, is that the Afghan government, it's got a shell or a veneer of democracy over it. We've held two incredibly fraudulent elections, two uh, uh, elections that were completely stolen. Um, and it's a, that's a fabric or a shell that falls over this government. But what is the government really? The government really is a, a, a corrupt patronage network of individuals. So if you knock out pieces of that network, the government collapses. And that's why you see this very successful assassination campaign that the insurgency is mounting. What you also see tied into that is accidentally the insurgency is reaping the benefits of a corrupt uh, patronage network of individuals because what happens in networks like that, they kill each other. Okay? Again, now we go back to all this money that we were talk I was talking about earlier. The tens upon tens of billions of dollars that we are spending in a country with a GDP of $15 billion. So people are going after this money. It's a very crass thing to say about the political order in Afghanistan. I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way. But imagine if you have a room of, 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 uh, of dogs that haven't been socialized and you keep throwing red meat into that room. Will they ever socialize or will they just kill each other? They'll kill each other. That's the situation you have in Afghanistan, the political system right now. There's so much money being chased after that they're killing each other for it, which then reaps the benefits for the insurgency. So when you see Hamid Karzai's half-brother killed or the mayor of, Ka of Kandahar killed, probably not done by the insurgency, probably done by a rival or having something to do with the vast amounts of money that's in that country. So the insurgency plays upon that. And again, you've had these two fraudulent, stolen elections that have disenfranchised and marginalized large parts of the population. That's why you see areas in the north and the west over the last couple of years moving over uh, to the insurgency side or being opposed to the government, uh, if you will. And then um, economically, what do we have? We have a country, again, $15 billion in GDP. Uh, where we're spending $120 billion a year in. 97% of Afghanistan's GDP, the licit part, and we can get into the, the, the drugs and the opium uh, later, because that's, that's the only real industry in Afghanistan. But the licit part, 97% of Afghanistan's economy is supported by foreign assistance. So we have been in Afghanistan since 2001, and all we have built economically is a system that relies solely upon foreign assistance to survive. So in 2001, when I think with the right intentions, the world came together and they said, we're going to rebuild Afghanistan. We feel like we let you down after 1989, et cetera. We have not done that. We've done everything possible to make it dependent upon a culture of foreign assistance, a culture of development aid that then bleeds into a corrupt political system that furthers the aims of an insurgency. Okay, that incre increasingly destabilizes Afghanistan and then has increasingly destabilized particularly Pakistan. So that's where we stand at today uh, in Afghanistan and juxtapose that with where we were a couple years ago. All right, so we've seen the war get larger. We've seen the insurgency grow stronger. We've seen support for the government diminish or decline. Um, I'll briefly talk about Pakistan because uh, I know we're on a, a tight schedule here with the radio and also too I want to make sure we have times for everyone's uh, uh, questions. But you look at Pakistan, and again, as I said earlier, I don't think anyone could say that Pakistan's in a better place than it was in 2009 or 2005 or 2001. One aspect that I want to talk about briefly is the drone strikes in Pakistan and the effect that it's had on Pakistan. President Obama has increased our drone strikes by about a factor of three in Pakistan. Um, last year, uh, we had about 700 militants uh, we killed through drone strikes. Um, of that, according to the New America Foundation, um, less than, well, only about 2% were actually what we call high value targets, actually meaning guys that are mid-level commanders, guys that actually have maybe 5 or 10 or 15 people who report to them. Um, only 2% of them were high value targets. Of that 700, only two of them actually made our FBI's watch list. Okay, of actually guys that our FBI says, you know what, these guys are real terrorists that we need to be concerned with. Only two. All those drone strikes. 
Okay, now you have competing numbers in terms of how many actual civilians are killed. I would tend to, to fall, just upon my experience, both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it, it, it being you know, an amateur military historian or, or whatever, just a, basically a, a, a history nerd, um, that the number of civilians killed is much, uh, much, it's much more towards the higher numbers than it certainly is towards our government's incredulous claim that we've not killed any civilians uh, in Pakistan via drone strikes. Um, so what do you get then? Well, you have this, this, this situation where you have a movement like the Pakistani Taliban, which didn't exist really uh, in the form that we now see it until 2004, 2005. You get a movement that now is finding popular support among people in Western Pakistan because one, uh, the Punjabi army has settled and is occupying Western Pakistan, something that had never occurred before out of uh, a negotiation and an agreement. And you have American drones conducting strikes, if not daily, at least weekly, that scare the hell out of you. All right? So now you see support for the Pakistani Taliban that probably wouldn't have occurred if we weren't doing these drone strikes. To what? Get two FBI watch list guys over the course of a year? So you wonder why then in Pakistan do we get to the point where the Pakistani public approval rating for the United States is the same as it is for Al-Qaeda. In a recent poll, a recent uh, opinion poll, both, pa both the United States and, and Al-Qaeda scored about a 14% in terms of public opinion approval. So certainly that is not getting us to a point where we want to be with Pakistan. Um, and, but we can, we can speak more about Pakistan when we get to the questions and answers. So you get to this point though in Afghanistan though where what are we going to do? Okay, we went from being waist deep to chest deep in, in quicksand, but we can't just pull out. Okay, you can't just wave the magic wand and disappear. Uh, for no other reason than simply if you envision Afghanistan as a house of cards, we're not the key card in that country. We're the whole card table. If the United States and the international community and its soldiers and its money were to leave right now, the place would collapse. And there's a dozen reasons why we don't want that. But for those who are concerned with practical, hard geopolitical reasons or rationales, simply do you want to see two million refugees going into Pakistan? Do you really want to see two million refugees going into Iran if there's another Afghan civil war like we saw in the 90s, which many people think there could be? So we can't just pull out. But what we need to do is we need to recognize that we are in a civil war there. Okay? This is a conflict that the political causes go back to the 70s. You know, when we went in there in 2001, which I agree with, okay, we, we intervened in an ongoing civil war. We took one side out of power, put the other side into power, but we never addressed the underlying root causes of the conflict. We don't ever address the reasons why they were fighting. In fact, we built a political system there that reinforced one element of the victors, that further disenfranchised and marginalized the other sides in the conflict. And now here we are in 2011 with this problem. So the first thing we have to do is recognize that we cannot take sides, that we have to become an arbiter. Okay? One acknowledging that Al Qaeda is not there, the Taliban is not the same as, as Al Qaeda. All right? There's differences for a number of reasons, membership, goals, uh, uh, et cetera, but that what we're engaged in by fighting the Taliban is just really taking one side against them and that we need to become a mediator, okay? We need to become an arbiter in a conflict as opposed to a participant in the conflict. How do you do this? Well, you know, I, I think a lot and when I resigned um, uh, a couple years ago, a lot of it was based upon my experiences in Iraq and I saw the mistakes we had made in Iraq uh, pushing the Sunnis to the insurgency, very much the same mistakes we're making in 2009, labeling them all terrorists that we can't talk to them. We've done that with the insurgency in Afghanistan. So the idea being is that the first thing we have to do is get our uh, battalion commanders or brigade commanders or political officers to reach out and speak to the insurgency and say, why are you fighting us? Two years ago you weren't fighting us, or three years ago you were fighting us. What is the grievance that's driving you to fight us? And not all are reconcilable, but most are. Next thing we have to do is seriously take uh, 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 an understanding and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, seriously have an understanding of the role our money is playing in that country, the hugely corrupting influence that that is having. Okay? And we need to reform how we actually deliver our economic assistance, deliver our development aid. Okay? Because right now what you're seeing is just people chasing after that money and it's giving them no chance to establish any, any framework of political order or political stability. And then what we additionally need to do is 
enter into serious diplomacy within the region. It's always amazes me, and it amazes everybody when they hear this, that the dividing line between uh, our Central Command and our Pacific Command, our two biggest military theaters uh, in the world, is Kashmir. That PACOM and CENTCOM are divided along the Indian-Pakistan border. That, that's absolutely insane. And I like to say, if you go to Washington, D.C., no one ever talks about Kashmir. We've got a special representative for everywhere else in the world, but we're not doing hard, earnest diplomacy with India and Pakistan. And one of the things of many ways you can describe Afghanistan is uh, um, a proxy war between India and Pakistan. We need to understand that and recognize that and work to resolve that. Okay? But I'm going to finish up here because I want to make sure we have uh, enough time for questions and answers. Uh, I can get further into the recommendations uh, during the Q&A. But just those three things, if we start doing those things earnestly and honestly, we will see stability begin to occur in Afghanistan. If we recognize what the causes of that instability is now, and we actually go after them and abandon this notion that we have to uh, 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 have victory or have uh, some type of, 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 of achieve this uh, uh, narrative of, of surging more troops and militarily defeating the insurgency because we're on the side of good, recognizing that we're not really wearing white hats in that country. To some people we are, but to many we're not. And if we actually go after and achieve our goals there, of stability in Afghanistan and stability in the region, that will require entering into s s serious and sincere uh, political negotiations at local levels, at the national level, and at the uh, international level in the region. So I want to thank you all for coming out. I look forward to the Q&A. When we get to that point, happy to talk about uh, Iraq, uh, defense budget reduction, uh, what it's like to be in an earthquake in Washington, D.C., um, whatever you'd like. But thank you very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Friday forum featuring Matthew P. Ho, Senior Fellow at the Center for International Policy. We will return to our speaker in a minute for the traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now, and please remember to keep them brief. In 2012, the City Club of Cleveland will turn 100 years old. We're planning a number of centennial events, and we'll be actively soliciting support from the community through our campaign for a new century. Our celebration will begin on October 10th of this year with the Conference on Free Speech at the Allen Theater. To learn more about the 100th anniversary events, visit the City Club website, www.cityclub.org. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Ideastream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We're pleased to welcome guests at tables today hosted by Baker Hostetler. Thank you for your partnership. Today's forum is the Aaron H. and Ruth S. Zeichick Memorial Forum, established with a generous gift from the estate of Aaron and Ruth Zeichick. Thank you for your support. We're also pleased to welcome students who are here as part of the City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from the Fred E. Scholl Foundation, Bernard L. Carr Chairman. With us today are students from Hawkins School and John Hay School of Science and Medicine. Will students please stand and be recognized? Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director, Carrie Miller. First question, please. Uh, Mr. Ho, except for the fact that uh, Pakistan has nuclear weapons, what was wrong with after 9-11 just going in there and bombing the heck out of uh, Afghanistan and leaving them rotten. I mean, what do we have to uh, waste all of that? You know, okay, we're in the oil business, but uh, what, you know, just do it and get out and forget it. What's, what's wrong with that? Um, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, bombing, uh, just bombing wouldn't have worked. It hasn't worked. We knew that in World War II. I mean, you, you, you watch, uh, uh, was it Fog of War with McNamara did after, before he did, died? He talks about how we knew the bombing campaigns weren't working in Germany and Japan. Didn't work in North Vietnam. No reason to believe just bombing would have worked in, in Afghanistan. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot to be said about what happened. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't think with Afghanistan, if we hadn't gone to Iraq, it would have been any better. And I say this because I don't think that if we had, if we had put 140,000 foreign troops in Afghanistan in 2003, 2004, we would have just been in this situation in 2005 that we are in now. Okay, that we didn't understand that there was a, there was a, 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 a civil war occurring there that has legitimate grievances with multi -side, with mo many sides, many layers, et cetera. But to your point of just why didn't we just abandon it and just, just go in, scatter al-Qaeda, and then chase al-Qaeda around the world uh, you know, in an intelligence and law enforcement manner, uh, which is the right way to go after al-Qaeda. Um, I, I think uh, um, there are issues in terms of morality that are involved. There are issues in terms of perception uh, that are involved. Um, I, I think one of the problems that we have right now um, with American foreign policy is the perception of the United States around the world. Uh, our foreign policy over the last 10 years can best be described as schizophrenic. Uh, if you were an Egyptian, uh, a, a young man or a young woman in Tahrir Square uh, six months ago, would you have any reason to believe the United States government had your best interests involved? Um, if you look at how we intervene in Libya but don't intervene in Bahrain, um, we're, uh, we have a foreign policy that is not consistent. Um, and so there are aspects of that that I think were understood at the time that we have a duty to do this. We have a role in the world. There are also those who actually believe that that's the right and appropriate thing to do is to try and build nations, is to try and um, uh, create societies that are more in tune and more in harmony with the world community. Um, I don't uh, concur with that. I think every nation has to build itself on its own. But I also have no problem with development assistance if it's done without political agendas. So. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Would you please expand on your reference to Afghanistan as being a proxy war of India and Pakistan? Sure. Um, that's a great question. Uh, uh, so what you see in, in this goes back, and, and, and folks who are much smaller than I am and understand it much better than I, I mean, this goes back for, 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 for decades, centuries in terms of how we got to this point today. But basically what you see is you see uh, elements within uh, Afghan government and society that are known to be allied with the Indian government, or at least perceived to be aligned with the Indian government, as well as elements within the Afghan insurgency that are perceived or known to be in line with the Pakistani government. Um, the Pakistan government has a policy of strategic depth wherein they are afraid well, first of all, they've been in the war with India four times, I believe, as well as a number of border clashes and tensions are already high, most militarized border in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they have a policy that they believe they need Afghanistan to fall back into. If India invades Pakistan, they need strategic depth, a place to fall back into. That means they need a reliable partner in Afghanistan. They're also feared uh, that Pakistanis are afraid that they will be encircled by the Indians, that if, if Kabul is allied with the Indian government, they now have enemies on both flanks. So when you get this idea that it's a proxy war, you do see various elements of India, uh, various elements within Afghan society, government and insurgency, supported by either India or Pakistan. Uh, and so you do have this very real feeling. You also, when you're in Afghanistan, um, everyone always points to Pakistan and says that's where all the problems are coming from. Um, there's an element of truth to that. The ISI does support the Afghan insurgency, but this gets into... Uh, you know, larger, deeper, more complex issues of what is Pakistan trying to do in terms of its own interests. Uh, and, and to go back to the question we just had about America's involvement there, particularly with Pakistan, Pakistanis feel they can't trust the Americans. If you look at the history of U.S.-Pakistan relationship over the last 60 years, half the time we're giving them F-16s, economic assistance, etc. And the other half, when it doesn't suit us, our needs anymore, uh, we, uh, we have embargoes and, and denial of foreign assistance or military aid to them. So the Pakistani government, I think for valid and sound reasons, is mistru does mistrust the U.S. government and feels that it needs to secure its own interests in Afghanistan, uh, particularly uh, if it's at the expense of relationship with the United States. 
Yes, I'm wondering if you could uh, say something uh, about uh, whether your organization is being heard by the administration and planners and strategists within the administration. And also because our foreign policy seems so irrational uh, for so long, do you feel that, that what drives that? I mean, I wonder in particular about the very size of our standing army, of our armaments, which is so huge in comparison to the rest of the world. So if all you've got is a hammer for a tool, yeah. everything begins to look like a nail, as they say. Yeah, um, with regards to my organization, as well as other groups that we've worked with over the past uh, uh, year or two, uh, we have met with uh, members of the administration. Uh, we have met with folks over at Pentagon and State Department. Um, we find uh, fairly uh, um, sympathetic ears. And, and most of our work, though, has been in uh, Congress, uh, work particularly uh, to a great degree uh, with Jim McGovern uh, and of Massachusetts, Democrat of Massachusetts, and Walter Jones, Republic of North Carolina. Um, you know, McGovern Jones bill, which required a, 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 the president to give a timeline to exit Afghanistan, came close to passing this summer, um, as well as then we work quite a bit on the Senate side. Uh, particularly with Jeff Merkley of Oregon, um, in his letter, uh, I think, I believe he got 28 signatures on the letter. Which, if you know anything about the Senate, to get 28 senators to sign a letter together, it, it's quite an accomplishment. Plus, we know of many, many other senators who are in line with us, but because of various reasons, either because they're committee chairs or because it's not the right thing for them to do, they didn't sign. So we work quite a bit with members of Congress. That's where I would say uh, uh, probably spend about 70% of my time. Um, with regards to the larger NASA security state that we have in this country, when you add it all up, when you add up the Department of Defense, when you add up the debt on defense-related, in, uh, uh, the, the interest on the defense-related debt, when you put in the, the Veterans Affairs Administration, you put in the State Department, put in USAID, uh, add in the intelligence community, uh, you're talking that we spend about a trillion dollars a year on, on NASA security in this country. Um, I like to quote uh, the columnist from Washington Post, Ezra Klein, uh, when he says that the United States federal government has become an insurance company with an army. And if you look at where the expenditures for most of our money uh, go, it does go to either uh, 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 so, you know, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and then national defense. Uh, and where I think we're going for, where we're going to see things being cut out of is those non-discretionary areas that are not defense or entitlement related. And I think that will have uh, a huge detriment on us in terms of NASA security. If our education, if our health care, if our infrastructure continues to deteriorate every year, if every year, every year you know you read in Time or in the Washington Post or whatever that the United States has sunk another level in terms of uh, where we are compared to our peers with education or infrastructure or health care, that, you cannot sustain the world's greatest military with that. You cannot. You cannot sustain 800 bases around the world indif indefinitely if you can't provide jobs for veterans when they come home. Eventually it will collapse. It won't collapse in a couple of years, but will collapse in 15 or 20 years. It's amazing when I go and I work with my peers from Europe, uh, and they look at us as complete fools. We are using 20th century tools in a 21st century world. Let's look at the Libya campaign. Okay, and look at the fact that NATO, our, our NATO allies that participated in the campaign with us, that did actually most of the operations, most of the bombing, we had to sell them $300 million worth of ammunition because they didn't have the stores for it. They didn't have the stuff put away for this. They went through it very quickly because they knew the Americans would supply it to them. Okay, so we get looked at as fools because we keep investing in a system that was meant to counter threats from the 20th century. We still operate under the 1947 National Security Act. All the institutions we have right now come from the 1947 National Security Act. In 1947, they were smart enough to understand that the world was changing, threats were different, and we needed to reorganize the United States government. They were also smart enough at that point to do the GI Bill and build the interstate highway system. Okay? We see also, too, is that we see a national security planning process that hasn't changed at all. So the same process that was used to educate President Reagan at the height of the Cold War or the first President Bush in the Gulf War has been used to support President George uh, W. Bush and President Obama during this last decade. 
So what we have to get to is in terms of, of not just where our priorities at, is it, you know, can we sustain on a, just a rational, hard level this, can we sustain tr a trillion dollars a year? And is that even worth it? Um, but what is this, you know, where are our priorities at? What, what are we getting out of this? And how can we actually make this country relevant 20 or 30 years from now? Because we won't be relevant in 20 or 30 years if we continue with uh, the institutions we have, have now. Um, and, and I could go on talking about this and, and, and ranting about this because it is, you see in Washington, D.C., that this uh, entrenched uh, uh, system that is just not, again, relevant for the way the world works now. And you get this feeling that our peers in Europe and Asia just shake their head, well, not, not feeling, because they actually do. They shake our head in disbelief that we're not moving forward with the world. So. Great uh, talk. My question twofold. Number one, what is the military intention or in, intent in trying to continue the wars in Afghanistan and still involved in Iraq? And the second part of it is, you, can you uh, elaborate your thoughts on Pakistan and Kashmir and India? Okay. Um, so the military intent in Afghanistan is simply victory. Uh, I mean, it simply is uh, 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 sustain this narrative that we went in Afghanistan didn't provide adequate resources, uh, but then the president uh, gave, and it's, it's, not, it's not just the Pentagon too, but it's also the, the political aspect of this. You know, President Obama, you know, he ran as a black Democrat against John McCain, the war hero. So on the campaign trail, he necessarily had to be strong on defense, okay? And what better way than to point out Iraq as a war that was a mistaken war and Afghanistan as the good war? The other side of it too, then, is um, the Pentagon no one's going to give them credit really for victory in, in Iraq, but Afghanistan, yeah, you can make the argument they didn't have the resources, and now they surged and now they won. So it really just comes down to nothing more than that, just a political desire to have a victory. The same things that kept us in Vietnam, the same things that hounded Lyndon Johnson, I believe are hounding our leadership today. And it, you feel funny saying this because it can't be that simple, but it, but it really is. You have, I meet with members of Congress and senators all the time. And over the last two years, I have had more than I even like to think about say to me, hey, look, I agree with you, but politically I can't say that. All right, so I think that's simply it. I mean, in the sense of, I get very little pushback from folks in the military about my views, very little pushback from folks at the State Department or in the intelligence community about it. But the thing is, we've got to win, okay? Uh, views on Pakistan and, and Kashmir, um, I'll say, as I said earlier, it's insane that we don't have a special representative for that, that this must become a priority. It's something that we have to address head on, that we don't even have a team. The last time I spoke to a friend of mine over at the State Department about our regional diplomacy, uh, uh, you know, was, was about nine months ago. And uh, he said, we don't even have a plan. And we don't. And that's why you see Mark Grossman, who seceded Ambassador Richard Holbrook, as our special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, not India, um, you know, scrambling to try and put something together because we don't even have a plan. So the first thing is actually do it, actually address the issue, appoint somebody who is responsible for diplomacy in that region with the goals of demilitarizing the border, okay, and, and taking away, or at least to a certain degree, de-escalating the threat that you're going to see some type of, of conflict uh, that starts off minor escalate into something that would be very tragic. Because uh, um, we still, even though, as I said before, we're, we're diminishing in stature and everything, uh, we're diminishing in our relevance, we still are uh, the world's strongest military, the world's strongest economy, we should still have the world's strongest diplomatic core, and we need to engage on that. Um, I mean, that would be my, 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 my chief and sole recommendation. And you really can't get into other issues with regards to Pakistan, India, and Kashmir, until you do that. I mean, so that would be the first thing, is, is allow the word Kashmir to be said in Washington, D.C. would be a, a great way to start it. Right now, it, 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 it's a word that's almost taboo in, in the town, so. Um, has the Obama administration's failure to close down Guantanamo Bay and their use of Bagram Air Force Base as a center for extraordinary rendition and questioning of terrorist suspects had an effect on delegitimizing American presence in Afghanistan or building up the insurgency? Oh, absolutely. Uh, without doubt. Without doubt. It, it, it's, uh, when I was at the State Department in uh, uh, 
2005, I remember reading cables and we would capture foreign fighters in Iraq and you would see that uh, the overwhelming reason when we interrogate them, the overwhelming reason why they went to Iraq to fight us was because of Abu Ghraib. Overwhelming. Um, uh, it is a stigma, it's a burden on us, it, it lends credence to our adversaries. Uh, it lends credence to Al-Qaeda's campaign. Thank God Al-Qaeda has killed more mo Muslims and provided nothing of benefit to, to Muslims around the world because we're doing everything we can in a lot of ways to reinforce their message that what they're doing is defending the Muslim world from Western invasion and occupation. Um, so it serves no purpose. Uh, it, 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 you know, and the other thing about Guantanamo and our failure to close it is that the reason why is because we don't want them here on this soil as if there's some kind of super villain, as if like Lex Luthor is at Guantanamo Bay. You know, I mean, and so we, 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 we're, we're giving them this, this privilege of allowing them to become these pariahs, these men without a state, that gives them a political constituency around the world. Uh, there are other aspects of it too, just in terms of our moral failings. You know, my understanding is the first 700 people we captured or took into custody in Afghanistan, we didn't capture, they were all given to us. Okay, so the amount of folks that we've incarcerated, that we've detained without any proof who were in, who turned out to be innocent is really pretty great. You know, I was in Afghanistan, um, two of the uh, Afghans I worked with quite a bit were bickering one time, and uh, uh, they, neither of them could speak English, and, and I couldn't speak Pashto, of course, so, uh, but the one did say, you know, they're bickering, he said, he looked at me and he said, he's Al-Qaeda, give me money. <laughs> That's absolutely how we've worked for 10 years. And that has a huge effect uh, uh, how others see the world, and it gives rise, it gives a reason for somebody to join a group like Al-Qaeda. Okay, it gives a reason for, you know, the Al-Qaeda membership is not much, is not very different, I don't think, from uh, the, the guy who uh, killed the, the, the 90 folks up in Norway, or the Timothy McVeigh. These people who see themselves as part of a, of a broad sweep of history, that they're taking part in the epic struggle of mankind, that somehow under God's banner, they are involved in uh, the sweep of history, you know? And so when you see zealots, on either side, uh, when you do things like this, you lead credence to the argument, or at least provide some kind of spark or desire. The other aspect too is it, it, it shames us. You know, it shames us. Why are we afraid to put these guys on trial in the United States? We've got the best justice system in the world. Could it be better? Of course. But, you know, I mean, why are we afraid to do this? So it, it cheapens us, it weakens us, and it all combines in this aspect that, yeah, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, the United States is not as relevant as we once were. The, uh, the picture you paint is, is quite bleak. <laughs> it's difficult to find anything positive in what you have said. With the past being a pretty good indication of the future, we've been so unsuccessful, really in Iraq, which may explode as soon as we depart. Afghanistan, you've already uh, been very specific about that. If we haven't much of a future that, and an idea that we will change and accomplish anything in the next two or three years, why shouldn't we pull out now? That's, that's, and that's a problem I think that's plaguing a lot of our, our, our forces and commanders in Afghanistan right now. I have a lot of friends who are still in and um, what I get is that some of our commanders, our ground unit commanders, have taken that, that view. So in Kandahar where you've seen some of our, our, our troop casualties go down, my understanding is because they've pulled back on all the dismounted patrolling, all the foot patrols they're doing because one, it walks right into the enemy's advantage Okay, exposing your, your troops to, dismounted troops to, to improvise explosive devices. But the other aspect is, what does it matter? If this place is not going to get any better than it is now, why do I, would I sacrifice any of my men for it? Um, so there is that aspect of it that, that, that again, is somewhat valid. Look, if, why don't we just leave now? If nothing's going to change. Um, again, and then because you, I, I don't want to see a collapse of Afghan society, uh, the problem, too, you get, though, in, in all these conversations, and whether it's about defense budget reduction or, or, or this, it's either you're all in or all out. And, and both sides of the aisle are equally guilty. You meet with a Democratic staffer or a Republican staffer, they either went to Harvard or Stanford or Columbia, and they all think the same way. Like, the only way that we can actually have presence is if we have troops on the ground. If we leave Iraq militarily, we won't have any presence there. No one else is going to put troops in. No one else is that foolish. The Iranians aren't going to occupy Iraq. They're not insane. 
They just saw what happened for the last 10 years next door to them. So this idea that, that you're either all in out is a fallacy. You know, if you're not in favor of having 12 aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier battle groups, you're automatically in favor of having zero. There's no rational alternatives. And we were talking earlier about with the president, he doesn't receive those alternatives. Everything it, 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 we do, we have a foreign pol policy that is over-militarized. I think some of the best spokespeople about that uh, in terms of why we need to demilitarize it are actually military officers because they see an overextension, an over-reliance, and a counterproductive nature by only relying on the military. But um, yeah, this, this notion that, uh, that we can't just leave, you know, and we do. We have to continue our reductions in troops in Afghanistan um, because our troop presence escalates the conflict, it fuels support for the insurgency. Um, but that doesn't mean we abandon it, you know, and that doesn't mean we, we, we just uh, leave countries to collapse. You can have things other than being all in or all out, and it's something that we need to develop, and, and, and hopefully it's something that uh, uh, will be this type of conversation we'll see more of on the campaign trail this coming year. I doubt it, but, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you'll see more of it, the discussion of where are we going, and okay, the last 10 years have not served us well, how do we do it better? So. Okay, if we're not all in or all out, who is going to be there from the United States? What quality of people, military, civilian? And I have a second question. What's going on with the role of women in Afghanistan? Sure. Yeah, great questions. Um, I, what, I would, what I would like to see is a reduction in forces uh, down to about the, the 20,000. Uh, level, primarily concentrated in the north and the west of the country, to provide a bulwark or, or level of support for those Afghans that are supportive of our presence in Afghanistan, who are af afraid of, excuse me, a Taliban resurgence, who come from uh, ethnic lines that are not tied with the insurgency. But then those troops, after we get down to that 20,000 level, that they come down over the next period of years, so that at this point, you know, in 2009 when I resigned, I, I thought we should be out of there by 2012, 2013. Um, at this point now, being 2011, heading into 2012, I think completely out of Afghanistan as a, militarily as an honest goal we could achieve by 2015, 2016. Um, you leave behind a robust diplomatic presence. I think you re completely redo your uh, economic aid. You do it non-politically, you do it fairly, you do it equitably, and you do it transparently throughout the country. You tie it into certain political benchmarks or certain political goals. Um, but the presence is much more of a diplomatic and development presence than it is uh, a military one. Um, you know, I don't think it should be what we're going to see in Iraq. Say we do get all our troops out of Iraq end of this year, which I don't think is going to happen, but say if we did, we're still going to have a State Department force that's 17,000 strong in Iraq. Uh, 8,000 or so of them are going to be armed contractors. You know, if you're an Iraqi, and you're going to almost year 10 of the occupation, does it matter if the guy's in a uniform or if he's got a baseball cap on and a polo shirt, but he's got a rifle and he's not from here? You're still being occupied. You're still providing reasons for people to have legitimate grievances against an occupation or pushing people to support uh, either extreme groups or other outside players, such as Iran or Saudi Arabia or whoever. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think you, you have to draw down to a level where you're just, you, you've got the civilian level there. And then who's going to be there? The Afghans are going to be there. And it's their country, and we've got to kind of keep that in mind. And you, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, women. And women, that's a, a very tricky, very difficult issue. It pulls out a lot of emotional heart spring, uh, pulls out at your heart quite a bit. Um, I will tell you, our troop presence there is not making life better for women in southern and eastern Afghanistan that uh, a woman in, in, in Afghanistan, in particular parts of Afghanistan, say south and eastern Afghanistan, uh, is more concerned with her children being killed by a roadside bomb or her children getting caught in the midst of a gunfight or her children or her house getting hit by a bomb than she is about her kids going to school. So the first aspect has to be ending the violence or reducing the violence. Uh, I will agree that, yeah, there's been gains made for women in some parts of the country a lot of the issues with the women are cultural issues that have to be resolved by that culture. You're not going to change a culture by the, 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 the barrel of a rifle. All you're going to make that culture do is retract upon itself and make it more reactionary. But um, what you need to do is get into some type of political negotiations, achieve some kind of settlement in Afghanistan, 
that actually guarantees women's rights. Because if you don't establish a political order, if you don't establish some form of political stability, you're going to achieve nothing in terms of development, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be education, whether it be women's and, and human rights. Um, but and also to this idea that somehow, uh, if anyone has this notion that the cause like government, the folks that we support, are champions of women's rights, you're completely wrong. Many of the members of the Karzai government are just as misogynist as the Taliban. They are just as fundamental in, in, in their views. They are just as harsh in their treatment. Um, the people we back in power are warlords, they're war criminals, they're drug lords, um, they're rapists. Uh, they have no intentions for supporting their people. It, the Karzai government, by its very nature, is the truest form of kleptocracy uh, that the modern world sees right now. Um, and that, on, that, I'll, on that happy note, I'll uh, wrap it up. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to Matthew P. Ho. Thank you, Mr. Ho. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.